How's it going guys? Welcome to the long overdue version of Plumbing's Cool Q&A, where I try and help answer viewers questions on all things plumbing. Today we're going to help out a viewer who needs some guidance installing plumbing consisting of a typical three-piece bathroom plus a floor drain that will be serving their hot therapeutic sauna. Lucky them. Quick disclaimer, my suggestions only apply to Ontario Canada Code and to a large extent Canada's National Plumbing Code. These code rules may vary differently within your jurisdiction, therefore, it's important to always check with your local guidelines before you apply any of these suggestions. But unless you catch me plumbing outside of Canada, I can assure you that what I'm about to tell you is right, at least by Canadian standards. Nonetheless, if I do say something that you disagree with, or raise an eyebrow at, please do feel free to spew your venom in the comments below, as I'm always a sucker for spirited debate. With that out of the way, let's get started. Okay. So this is the original drawing sent to me by the viewer, which is what we refer to in construction as a plan view drawing, which is typically looking in a one dimensional top down perspective, something like Google Maps. As you can see, we've got two rooms, a typical three piece bathroom consisting of a shower, a lavatory, referred to here as a sink, technically not the same thing, and a water closet, which is just a term us plumbers use for toilet to make it sound fancy. The adjacent room, which is gonna be the sauna room, consists of a fourth fixture, a floor drain to pick up any spilled or residual water when using the sauna, which I think is a pretty good idea and is actually standard fare for commercial sauna applications. This four fixture configuration reminds me very much of a project that I challenged my intermediate level apprentices with, minus the sauna, because adding that fourth fixture in throws a bit of a monkey wrench in variety compared to having to plumb in only a three piece bathroom, which is almost always easily wet vented as a single group, not so straightforward with a fourth fixture and which opens up several options. And as an added twist, we can see that all these fixtures are going to discharge into a sewage ejection pit, which will get pumped out to higher ground once the sewage reaches a certain level, which suggests that this is all being plumbed in a basement, or at least on grade, and well below the available sanitary building drain. We'll also take a closer look at that a little later on. So first glance at this well-intentioned image, I'm already spotting a number of errors, or at least omissions or uncertainties. Let's take a closer look at these discrepancies. So to outline, clarify, and correct these discrepancies, I decided to redraw this in good old isometric perspective, what I like to call fake 3D, due to its lack of a vanishing point. I know that drawing in isometric trips up a lot of my students, but trust me when I say that learning isometric drawing, even rough isometric drawing, can come in very handy if you're in any mechanical trade. If you want to learn more about how to draw isometric, reach out to me, and with enough demand, I might just make a video on it. I should also add that this isometric drawing is not the scale of the original. So if the proportions seem off from the original image, it's because they very likely are. The purpose of this isometric drawing is to clarify the viewer's piping configuration and requirements, not scale. So I'll be sure to point out if there are any critical lengths or distances to be concerned about. I'm gonna give practical pipe sizes that reflect the typical material that'll be accessible and installed. For example, while the theoretical minimum size for a lavatory drain is actually inch and a quarter by code, most installers install plastic piping, which is now virtually non-existent in inch and a quarter. So for all intents and purposes, the smallest size we're going to be dealing with is inch and a half. So the first thing I noticed on the original drawing is that the toilet's drainage pipe appears to be labeled as 4 inch. Although you're certainly allowed to run a 4 inch drainage branch, it's not necessary to do so. Notably, since although the toilet's flange is sized 4 inch by 3 inch, its fixture drain is actually 3 inches in diameter. And a 3-inch drainage branch can carry up to 27 fixture units at a quarter inch per foot. Way more than the total load from all these fixtures, which equates to only about 10 and a half fixture units at most. But if you want to upsize the drainage branch to 4 inch, then go for it. As long as you don't downsize, which is a cardinal sin in plumbing. The original illustration suggests the toilet being wet vented with the lavatory, referred to as a sink by the viewer in this case, which is certainly legal and recommended as long as the developed length of the toilet does not exceed the total developed length of three meters on the horizontal and one meter on the vertical in distance measuring to where the wet vent connects. Make sure to come up with your pipe so that the center of the toilet pipes at least 12 inches from the finished wall behind it. So if you're working against wood or metal studs, for example, that equate to at least 12 and a half inches to the face of the stud, taking into account the drywall. Be sure to add even more clearance if you're planning on tiling the wall. Okay. On to the lavatory. We commonly and casually call these sinks, but by code book definition, we differentiate bathroom sinks as lavatories when compared to the likes of kitchen sinks or laundry tubs. This is because bathroom sinks, or lavatories, 
impose a smaller load on the plumbing system, which can affect drainage and venting size. By the looks of it, our viewers got the right idea, in that they appear to be utilizing the lavatory's drain as a wet vent for the toilet. If you're curious about what wet vents are and how they work, feel free to click on the link above for a very short demonstration. As properly suggested by the viewer, if you're connecting the wet vent horizontally onto the 3 inch or 4 inch horizontal branch, you have to connect using a Y fitting. You cannot connect using what's called a sanitary T, such as this one here. So if you are connecting horizontally, the Y can be on its side, or it can be rolled so that the branch is coming upward, whatever really makes sense for the installation, given the clearance that you have below ground or below the floor. Now there are a few important requirements in order to deem this a proper wet vent. First of all, the lavatory's drainage must be a continuous size of 2 inch throughout its entire length. This is the minimum size when you're wet venting a toilet. Second, the lavatory must drain in a continuous waste and vent configuration. This means that the lavatory's trap arm must connect into the branch of an upright 2 inch by inch and a half by inch and a half sanitary T or TY for short with the two inch bottom side draining down toward the toilet's fixture drain and the upper inch and a half vent side of the sanitary T running up toward open air. Now I've gotten some pushback on my Instagram from some uh, passionately opinionated US plumbers that the continuous vent serving a wet vented toilet needs to continue as two inch. I think it may fall under UPC or Uniform Plumbing Code requirements, which may be applicable in some states. For the record, and for all intents and purposes, we in Canada are not regulated by UPC. The U in the acronym doesn't stand for universal around the globe. And Canadian code requires only an inch and a half vent for a toilet, whether wet vented or not. And until I'm doing any plumbing outside in the US or where UPC code applies, maybe one day, stay tuned, this inch and a half vent is perfectly legal in Canada. Let the mudslinging and eye gouging continue in you. Okay, the sauna floor drain. The smallest allowable size for floor drain is two inches, which is correctly depicted in the original image. However, what is blatantly missing is a proper vent for the two inch floor drain. I have a hunch that the viewer may have thought they were wet venting this floor drain with the shower, which can be made possible. However, in the shower's current configuration, it wouldn't be acting as a proper wet vent. More on that later. In the meantime, we need to decide how we're gonna vent this floor drain. Okay, so we got two options. We can individually vent it by installing a sanitary T on its back, or in this case, a Y with a fitting in 45 on its back, and running a minimum inch and a half size vent below ground and upward so that it ultimately terminates to open air. The other more efficient and probably easier solution, maybe, would be to wet vent the sauna's floor drain with the shower drain, as the viewer appears to suggest, and as mentioned earlier. And I'll show you how to do that when we discuss the shower drain in a moment. In the meantime, there are a few important details we need to point out with respect to the floor drain if we're going to keep it legal. When you run the trap arm, that's a segment of pipe between the P-trap's weir and its protecting vent, be sure not to exceed a change in direction of greater than 135 degrees from the trap's weir before connecting it to its protecting vent. That's equivalent to three 45 degree elbows. And speaking of elbows, do not ever use 90 degree elbows on their side for sanitary drainage as it's illegal. Doing so can contribute to the eventual clogging and it'll become a pain if you ever need to run a drain snake through it. Rather, use only 45 degree elbows to change direction horizontally, as is the case in the drawing. Finally, although I don't think it'll be an issue in this scenario, the trap arm can't exceed a length of 2.5 meters or eight feet two inches before connecting to its vent. I haven't seen the original site, but it's a pretty safe bet that this runs a lot shorter than eight feet. Finally, all floor drains must be primed. This means that they require regular supply of water to be fed to them so that the trap seal doesn't evaporate, thereby causing harmful and often stinky sewer gas from entering the building. This can be done in a whole number of ways, but my favorite and recommended method is to use what's called a mechanical trap seal priming device, which is a discussion that deserves a whole other video. For now, I will tell you that a trap seal priming device intermittently feeds clean water to the drain's trap be a flexible tube that gets attached to or inserted into the drain's pipe just below the drain's body but before the trap itself. By code, the minimum size of a trap seal priming tube is 3 8 inside diameter, which equates to about half inch on the tube's outside diameter, depending on the material used. 
You can even opt for standard half inch pecs if you have that lying around, which measures about 5 8 outside diameter. Way more than the required minimum size and much more durable than the cheap polyethylene traditionally used for priming. For trap seal priming device, my favorite is the P2 Trap Seal Primer model P500 made by Precision Plumbing Products, or PPP, which can prime up to two floor drains. There's certainly cheaper alternatives out there, but this one's never failed me and can be found in most any reputable plumbing supplier. I'll leave the link in the description below. Okay, on with the shower drain. So the viewer is in the shower drain size at 2 inch, indicating developed length of 12 feet which is technically fine. By the way, the length of the fixture drain portion after the vent or the overall length of a wet vent do not matter. There is no limit as long as you maintain proper slope throughout. Now, by Ontario code requirements and more so for domestic applications, you're even allowed to size a shower drain as small as inch and a half, presuming that it's serving a single standard shower control with a single head. Although I have been hearing rumblings from other viewers who are out west, namely the provinces of BC and Alberta, the inspectors are starting to demand a minimum two inch size for shower drains, which frankly, in my opinion, is downright stupid and unnecessary for a number of reasons, but I digress. If you disagree with me and would like to enlighten me as to why a two inch shower drain is necessary, then please do so in the comments below. Until then, two inch or inch and a half is fine in this case, whatever you prefer and able to fit below the floor. With respect to venting, although the shower drain appears to be vented, the original illustration dictates that it's actually not vented properly. Specifically, it's showing the vent to be what we call back vented, which is legal. But this vent appears to be coming out of the side of the fixture drain by means of a Y fittings branch placed horizontally parallel to the shower drain, which is illegal for dry vents because the sideways configuration runs the risk of the vent becoming clogged with solids over time, thus blocking the vent. And vents are generally not serviceable, or you might not even know that it's clogged. Therefore, the code dictates that whenever you dry vent a horizontal fixture drain, the vent's connection must be above the horizontal center line of the fixture drain you're venting. So while the viewer can certainly utilize that Y fitting if they want to, they have to roll it upward so that the bottom of the vent connection sits above the midline of the shower drain's pipe. Note, however, that this rule won't apply if the connecting vent were to be a wet vent. Then the viewer's configuration would be absolutely legal as is the case with the wet vent that's connecting to the toilet's fixture drain using a Y on its side. Speaking of wet vents, I suggested earlier that we try and utilize the shower drain to wet vent the floor drain in the sauna room. However, if we're going to legally do so, we need to reconfigure the shower drain's venting so that the vent connection is in a continuous waste and vent configuration, similar to the lavatory's wet venting of the toilet. This is necessary to ensure that the wet vented fixtures receive an adequate supply of air because putting it sideways is going to inhibit that airflow. Installing continuous waste and vent configuration may not be possible if the drainage pipe is not deep enough or if it's running in a shallow joy space because you'll need to have enough room to be able to stand a sanitary tee vertically to connect the inch and a half vent at the top, continue the drainage pipe at the bottom of the TY. You can save some required vertical space by opting for a fitting for uh, fitting in 90 degree elbow and a couple of 45 degree elbows at the bottom, which will shorten your vertical height. Again, avoid using a 90 degree elbow at the bottom because technically it's illegal. So 245s should suffice for change in direction. You'll also have better luck pulling this off if you opt for an inch and a half shower rather than the two inch shower because upsizing to two inch will make everything that much deeper. If you can't fit a continuous waste and vent configuration, then you'll unfortunately need to back vent the shower and vent the sauna floor drain separately in the same manner. But try to be efficient whenever possible. By the way, if your shower drain is acting as a wet vent, then there's no limit on the wet vent's length. All that matters is that you maintain proper slope, which is a minimum quarter inch per foot or one in 50 for you metric folks. Also, while I was producing the content for this video, the viewer reached out to me again and they asked whether they can install an air admittance valve instead of properly venting the shower to open air. They explain that they have structural limitations that make it difficult, although not impossible, for them to tie to a proper vent. For the record, avoid using an air admittance valve, what we often call a cheater vent, whenever possible, because they are not real vents. Even our code books loosey-goosey on whether AAVs are legal. Apparently, the viewer explained that if they really have to, they can run the shower vent around the wall perimeter to get to the other side where there's more clearance for the vent but they'll need to drill through a bunch of wood studs around the perimeter of the sauna room. I'd still reason that this would be the best option, even if they're not just studs 2 and 1 8 inch deep, 
which is typically the hole size, made to allow for one and a half inch plastic piping. And later cover the notchings with inexpensive steel hammer on protection plates they could pick up at the local plumbing supplier. Just make sure not to trap the vent in any way. You could run it level or even with a bit of fall toward the shower drain to help drain out any trapped water. But if they do nonetheless opt for installing an air admittance valve instead, a number of requirements have to be met. And in such a case, I'd most certainly vent the floor drain separately on its own. And these are the requirements for air admittance valves. Purchase an AAV that's ASSE certified, such as this OD Sure vent or Sioux Chief's Turbo vent. The AAV must be installed in an accessible location where it's not subject to freezing. It's got to be a minimum of six inches above any insulation materials and where it has free flow access to air. Another possible creative alternative to legally vent and avoid the installation of a cheater vent is to make the sauna's floor drain the wet vent. Because a wet vent has no limit on length, we can actually run the floor drain's wet vent drain toward the shower close enough to be able to pick it up without violating the shower trap arm's maximum length, which is 5 foot 11 if it's an inch and a half trap or 8 foot 2 inches if the shower has a 2 inch trap. You can then swing around and return to the 3 or 4 inch branch. Remember, the uppermost fixture of all wet vents have to be in a continuous waste and vent configuration, which will require adequate underground vertical clearance. This is only an inch and a half example. A floor drain is going to require a two inch variant, which is going to make it that much deeper. Plus, the extended run of the wet vent will lead to greater total fall, which runs the risk of ending up below the three or four inch drainage branch you're intending on connecting to, making it impossible to connect to it. So, if you're going to opt for this method, do some very careful grade calculations to make sure that you have enough vertical clearance. Okay, last but not least, the sewage ejector. There wasn't much specified about the sewage ejector in the original drawing, but there are a few important items I think are worth pointing out. Before we get into it, if you want to learn a little more about installing or replacing a sewage ejector, click on the above link, which will take you to my comprehensive video on doing so. First thing I noticed, is that the viewer has four inch pipe going into the ejection pit. While four inch is certainly the minimum size necessary for a sanitary building drain, you don't really need this to be four inch in this particular scenario, although it is common. But three inch is more than large enough to serve these four fixtures. Either size is fine. Also, because we're dealing with stinky sewage, the code mandates the installation of an airtight lid, which is often by design if purchasing a proper ejection pit. Because an airtight lid restricts free flow of air, every ejection pit must have a vent that continues full size to open air. The minimum size of the ejector's vent needs to be one size smaller than the incoming drainage pipe, but no smaller than two inch. There's another reason why you might want to opt for a three inch drainage branch going into the pit instead of four. Because installing a four inch branch would mean that you technically need to run a honking three inch vent all the way up through the roof if you want to truly abide by the code. But if I'm to be honest, most of the residential sewage pits I've seen over the years have typically only had two inch, with a few exceptions, regardless of the incoming drainage pipe size. And they work just fine. With that said, back on the topic of air admittance valves. Do not ever substitute a proper vent with an air admittance valve when you're venting a sewage ejector, which will cause drainage and pumping issues because the air admittance valve does not have the capacity to alleviate positive pressure, only negative. Always run a proper vent, especially with sewage ejectors or sealed pump assemblies. Last point I want to make is that a sewage ejector's discharge line, formerly what we call a force main, requires three main components for proper operation and servicing. They are, in the order of flow, a union connection, a check valve, and a stop or isolation valve. You can often find these components as a single unified assembly which make installation a lot easier and probably a lot more cost effective too. And I think that concludes my long-winded elaboration into what would otherwise seem like a simple and straightforward plumbing system. As is often the case, they're usually much more than meets the eye and the devil's always in the details. I hope you guys got some good value in learning something useful from this video. As always, if you have any interesting plumbing scenarios or curiosities, please do reach out and let me know. I'd be happy to try and help you out. Till next time, Thanks for watching and inquiring.